We're going to talk, we're starting a new, um, really the second half of the book on, and in particular we're going to be talking about development strategies. Um, a development strategy means an approach or perspective, methodology, whatever you want to call it, on how to take this world from a state of underdevelopment and poverty to a state of essentially social justice, where people have human dignity or treated inclusively, etc. And so this is, so chapter one, my strategy is to define lots of problems. And chapter two is define the ideal situation we ought to be in. And then chapter three is how do we move from problems to, you know, a, a good situation. Um, in chapter four, um, engineering for community development, it's gonna become very specific. We're gonna talk about the approach um, to use a development strategy called participatory development to improve a community. And uh, so it's, it's sort of an application of all the ideas in the book to engineering for community development. So today, um, we're gonna start um, this uh, week with um, um, four development economist perspectives on how to um, fix problems. And uh, um, next week, we will do the health perspective, the education perspective, and the business perspective, okay? So, so uh, um, in this week, um, I'm starting with uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Um, he uh, is a, a professor of economics at Columbia University, um, and he's a director of their Earth Institute. He's past, past director of the UN Millennium Project work on and on the Millennium Development Goals, and uh, he's also in charge of the Millennium Villages Project. Um, he's been an advisor um, for a number of years to Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General on development issues. He recently wrote this book, um, The Age of Sustainable Development, that you, um, you obviously know about because you did a homework problem in chapter one, where you saw him lecturing, okay? So you've heard from him a fair amount already. Um, and. Uh, what we're going to do is go back to his earlier book because it's still quite relevant. Uh, it's a 2006 book called The End of Poverty. All right. The Economic P Possibilities of Our Time is the, is the subtitle. So Professor Sachs gave an excellent talk last year at Ohio State um, under a, a university-wide uh, seminar held over in the Mershon Center. I had the opportunity to chat with him afterwards. He's a very interesting gentleman. Um, has amazing broad perspective on issues. Um, he seems to have been everywhere. Um, so his basic approach and philosophy is, is number one, rich, rich countries aren't helping enough. Okay? And he quantifies that quite carefully about the promises that have been made in terms of what countries will say they'll give in terms of percent of their GDP, and they're not doing it. Um, most people in the US think we're given like 20% of our budget for international aid. It's so far from that, it's unbelievable, okay? We're down around 1%, okay? So, so we're, and we're quite a bit less than um, a number of other countries like in Europe. Um, well, the second point he makes, the preconditions of infrastructure, like roads, power, ports, healthcare, and education, will, will allow markets to become powerful forces for development. But he says, you know, in um, Many countries, for instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, these things are not in place, so it's hard for the country or region or village to get going, okay? And uh, so he feels that the, we should be helping build that infrastructure that, so that we enable people to work hard and get themselves out of poverty. He sort of wants to, like, move, he, the way he says it is he wants to move, I heard him give a talk on this book back in, 06 actually, he wants to move people one rung up the ladder. Get them on the ladder so they can start climbing themselves, okay? Um, so what he says is that without these preconditions of infrastructure that basically the markets ignore the poor and the magic of the market <coughs> just doesn't happen and they can't get wealthy, okay? Um, so he wants to provide aid and then help markets um, via fair rules of the game, in other words, in terms of trade. We'll more on that in a little bit. So he starts out, when he says end of poverty, he, he's later a little more careful and says what he means by that. So 
he defines extreme poverty as less than one dollar PPP per day. Okay, um, and then he says that's where survival is in question. Moderate poverty he calls one dollar to two dollar a day, where basic needs are barely met. You're hungry every day, and, and worse. Um, and then relative poverty he's talking about something that's essentially in well is in every nation of, on earth, and that is is where your incomes are less than some percentage of the nation's average income. Um, and there's lack of educational and health care opportunities that hurt social mobility. I mean, read the U.S. I mean, this, this applies to the United States, too, of course. Um, well, his goal, he says, is, is to focus on the extreme poor and give them the first step up out of the ladder. And he argues that people are in a poverty trap. Okay, we're going we're to quantify that carefully, actually, with differential equations uh, later in class. But... Um, the, his point is, is, is if you're, a poverty trap basically means something like, it means this. It means that if you are so poor, you, it turns out you're not able to get rich. In other words, you don't have the resources to get rich. You need, and he says, you need something to get going. And once you get going, you can make yourself wealthy. Okay? They're sort of, uh, because they're poor, that's why they stay poor. Can't get out of it. They can't get an education. They can't get you know a job, or they can't get a um, health care, and so on and so forth. It keeps them at the bottom. Okay. Um, so basically, his point is is that in the past um, there hasn't been enough investment to break traps. A lot of people looked at. Investment in foreign aid since the, it's basically been going on since the second end of Second World War, um, um, and uh, it's a lot of money. It's it, it's been put into that. We'll talk more about that later. And a lot of people get really upset because they say, look, we're pouring all this money down the drain. It's not doing done anything. Look at these countries are still in the same condition. We're getting worse. His point is is well, we're not really getting at the issues that would get them on the first rung of the ladder and get them moving up. So he, he actually advocates, uh, you know, a, a, a increasing aid, addressing those issues of infrastructure and so on, okay? We're ending some suffering, but we're not getting at root causes, he says. So what is economic growth? Um, well, you need saving and capital accumulation. Um, savings just, you know, you can think of it as money, okay? But capital accumulation means many things. And capital accumulation means... Um, you know, a computer, it means a chair, it means a house, it means uh, a tractor, it means a shovel, a rake. I mean, it's all the stuff, right? I mean, and uh, capital is all around you all the time. Um, and in a, in a poor country, there's often not saving, but there's also not capital accumulation, okay? Um, and they, for economic growth, it's well known that you need technological advances. Um, uh, and a resulting rise in output for a given amount of inputs because e technology creates efficiency, right? It extends human capability. And economists know very well that throughout, the, right, about the history of technology and its impact on economic development. It's profound, it has huge influence on economic development. Um, you just think of what the Industrial Revolution did, that's technology, right? And the subsequent, you know, of course, it created a little bit of pollution in the meantime, but. The point is, is that technologies really mattered a lot. And the countries that didn't embrace technology for one reason or another, because of culture, or weren't able to get it, haven't moved forward. When they do analyses of these countries that are, you know, have lagged behind, one of the key issues is lack of technology. Okay? You should be hearing engineering here, right? Um, the other issue sometimes is having enough natural resources per person. Um, you know, if you're living in a, in a resource poor area like a desert, um, you know, compared to the Midwest where we have endless farmland, right, um, and water, I mean, my goodness, the world's going to have big water problems, but not Ohio, we can just drain Lake Erie, right? So, of course, the rest of the U.S. will be doing that too, but, but the point is, is that, you know, natural resources are really valuable. And, you know, it doesn't mean that if you have natural resources, it doesn't mean a poor country is going to properly use those resources. Okay. But um, they are important in order for a country to advance economically. 
economic decline, what causes that? Well, lack of saving. If you have no extra money, you can't save money. You can't accumulate capital because you can't buy it. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if your kids are hungry every day, you're not going to be able to go buy a tractor. You're not going to be able to buy, you know, maybe what you need to become more productive, the fertilizer or whatever, okay? Um, if there's an absence of trade, creates problems. I mean, there can be infrastructure problems. I don't have a port. I don't have a road. I'm not able to transport because I don't have a vehicle. And, of course, if there's violence, that's a huge issue, um, whether it's a war or just other types of violence and criminal behavior. Um, of course, there can be monetary chaos. I mean, you look at the inflation rates in some countries, even today, um, it's just astounding. What, do, if you think about the impact of the rate of inflation on the economy and people's savings and everything, I mean, it's unimaginable. What, what is, uh, Venezuela is a country right now that's having a terrible problem with inflation. Um, it's, it's quite high. But, you know, it's, it's not unusual for some countries to be having, you know, over 100% inflation. Okay. Um, this is really tough on an economy. Um, price controls historically caused many, many problems. Um, Venezuela is doing that right now, in fact. Um, and the lack of specialization. You know, one of the reasons we're, we, um, the economies work good is because of the notion of specialization. In other words, everybody does what they're good at, and then we all trade. That's a lot better, it's more efficient than if we all try to do everything. Okay, that, that's a huge difference, it's a huge issue. And, and, and essentially, you know, that's what's going on in the less developed countries. They don't have this kind of an economy going, everybody's doing what they're good at, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so that creates um, a lot of problems. And then there's the problem of technological reversal, actually. So you, you lose a child, your oldest child due to AIDS. So the younger children, so, so what happens then is, is that oldest child, let's say, was, um, knew how to farm, the technology of agriculture, okay? And uh, you lose him or her, then the younger kids have to do it, but you know they don't have the technical know-how, they're not getting good yield. So, so you can actually go backwards. Um, of course, natural resource decline with soil depletion. Um, productivity shock, um, this is a, a technical term in economics, actually, shock. It comes in many forms, but productivity shock, too, is a technical term. So it, basically the way you think, and we'll be defining this later in class, but you think about how productive you are, okay, and a shock means there's a, a sudden drastic reduction in your productivity. Why? Well, a natural disaster, a war, disease, so on and so forth can really um, hurt. Um, population growth in, in, in some countries, um, the sons uh, um, inherit um, the land from, well, it's dad, okay, and uh, they split it. I mean, it doesn't take much uh, math to figure out that a few generations this becomes a problem. Uh, this is what happened in Ireland, right? Ireland had a deep problem. Um, so these kind of traditions um, make it so that the, the offspring don't end up with enough, essentially enough land to support their family after a few, you know, number of generations, depending on how much um, <coughs> land they started out with. Um, so why are countries poor? Now he has his theories. If you want to read a really good book on this, the one I would recommend is referenced in in uh, the book. It's uh, Asima Glue and Robinson, um, and uh, uh, it's it talks a, a, it's the current best view by economists and political scientists on why some nations are rich and why some nations are poor, and uh, it's a good read. It's um, they point to the importance of institutions. Okay, Sachs has got has some different conclu conclu different conclusions. <coughs> Number one, he he says that this is. Uh, a poverty trap problem because he's focused on an extreme poverty. So it makes it impossible to get out of poverty. You don't have infrastructure. You can't save. You can't, there's a lack of uh, natural capital. Um, and there's health problems, for instance. If you live in some regions in Africa, um, the very climate is more conducive to malaria than other climates. So we don't have a malaria problem in Ohio. Why? As not as common in Ohio, let's say. 
well, we have this uh, weather out here. You know, it's killing nasty things, little bugs. Okay. So he says they need help to break the trap. Okay. <laughs> Physical geography, he points to a number of problems with fertile soil, um, access to water, ports, um, being landlocked, how hard that is on a country. Um, you know, you can think of an ex examples of this. Name a landlocked, can you, there's plenty of landlocked countries, landlocked poor countries. Take uh, Bolivia, okay, is, is a good example from Latin America. And uh, so it does have, you know, quite an impact on an economy. Uh, of course, the disease problems in the tropics. Um, he says, though, all these things can be overcome. Next, the government problems of the fiscal trap. So the governments can't provide infrastructure, health care, education to get the economic growth. Why? Because they can't raise the taxes because there's too much poverty, okay? They may be inept, corrupt, or incapacitated by war or violence, conflict, <coughs> so they can't collect taxes. Um, and the rich, often the oligarchy in a country, that run the country in these governments, you know, they're not going to make sure they're not paying a lot of taxes either. It's not like they're going to, you know, so it becomes a tough situation. Then a lot of the countries carry a debt load. So, so let's say you have a country X uh, has a dictator, um, manages to talk, uh, a big financial institution like World Bank or somebody in to give them a loan. They get the loan, they rip it off, doesn't go anywhere, uh, ends up in a Swiss bank account. And what happens then? They still, owe the, the country owes the money, okay? And they're held to task on this issue. Uh, that's a very expensive thing for them. Governance failure. Well, is the government oriented towards development or the people running the government just oriented towards filling power and filling their own pockets with money? And will they invest in the right projects? Um, or set up the right private possibility for the private sector to take over? And how many, how many bribes and side payments are there? You know, this, this whole issue of corruption is, is, is sometimes difficult to understand. It's, it's, but it's very, very important. Um, and then can a government maintain peace and safety and protect private property without people having to hire their own security guards, um, which becomes expensive. All right, so without these things, you can get a state failure. We have that going on, you know, in the world these days, too, with wars, revolution, coups, and anarchy. So there's all kinds of problems with governments. There are some cultural barriers. Um, Professor Sachs claims um, religious norms, cultural religious norms, obstruct women. Um, if you think about it for a minute, that's a pretty profound impact on the economy. So let's take half of our adults and cut them out of the economy. That's essentially what it's doing. How in the world can an economy succeed in the today's competitive environment doing that? It's just, it seems like there's no way. Okay? So uh, that's, a, that's quite a big issue. And then, of course, de denying women education um, and, and the, the, sort of the lack of economic productivity for their family, just their right to work. Um, it, these things, a lot of this results in um, increased family size and child rearing responsibilities. In other words, mom takes care of the kids. Uh, we're going to talk, talk about it. Banerjee and Duffalo do an economic analysis of, of why, have a, why have a child when you're making less than a dollar a day. And uh, we're gonna come to that issue. And it's, it's really quite interesting what the decision, the decisions are completely rational. It, it seems irrational to have a bunch of kids when you don't have any money to feed them, okay? Um, so other barriers like this are set up by, as everyone knows, religious or ethnic minorities, um, you know, against uh, women. Um, we talked some about that before. Geopolitics, a very important issue is this issue of trade barriers that are erected by rich and powerful countries that impede poor countries' development. You know, we hardly hear about this stuff, but it is a fundamentally important issue. Um, you know, you always hear the U.S. saying fair trade, fair trade, fair trade. Yeah, well, it's fair trade, fair trade, fair trade, fair trade when it's for, it helps us. But once they start talking about agriculture, oh, no, the farmers start screaming in the U.S., and we're, no, we don't do fair trade. That's, those are the realities. 
happens in Europe too. France is a classic example. Okay, they, pr they protect their, their own citizens. Okay, so if we truly opened our market, opening our markets would be fundamentally important for the developing world. I mean, fundamentally, because, well, why should we be giving them aid? Why aren't they, why aren't they selling us stuff? If we've got money to buy, why aren't we letting them sell us stuff? It's like, duh. I mean, so this is a big problem. Um, and if you want to read, there's a, one homework problem. I, I really recommend you to look at a movie. Uh, it's called The End of Poverty? Question mark. Okay. And it's got um, a number of these economists in it. And they talk a lot about this issue, the, the unfair trade in the world and, and how the rich protect themselves and uh, the importance of it. Uh, and then there's the economic sanctions issue, which is, uh, that's a tough one because, you know, I think everybody knows that economic sanctions hurt the people and they don't always hurt the ruler that's doing all the nasty things, right? And then you expect to punish everyone and expect them to rise up and overthrow their government or something, you know? Uh, it's just highly unrealistic because of the power structures in these a lot of these countries. It's, it's not going to happen. You know? So it, this, is a, this is really quite a difficult issue. I'm not saying I have a solution to it, though, because, you know, but I think we should debate it carefully. So lack of technological innovation. Um, so the way innovation goes in a poor country, there's plenty of innovators and smart people in a poor country, just as much in a rich country. Um, but let's say you do some research and development. You manage to get a lab going, get something, you invent the next iPhone, whatever. You're going to be able to sell it? You know? You, you got something cool, you're going to be able to sell it? Well, you're probably not going to be able in that country because nobody's got the money to buy it, your product, whatever it is. And so you say, then, then you have to like export. What a major problem. So in, in, as opposed to in the United States, for instance, you come up with some innovative whatever, okay? You start, you start making money, okay? Well, and then people learn about it and they, more people buy it, right? Oh, this is cool, buy this. And it, it goes like that. And then the thing is, is, when you make money, you're like, ooh, I made money on this. I'm gonna do, go do more innovation. And you get this, this so-called virtuous cycle going and before you know it, you know, that's what has made the United States really technologically advanced. That, that cycle has go, been going a long time. Um, and it's, it's really important. And as little stat matters, 98% of the patents in the world are in rich countries. It's not because people in poor countries are stupid. They can't come up with ideas for patents. It's just that they can't get it going. They can't, you know. Um, so... With respect to diff diffusion, but there's some opportunities. There's some brightness here. With respect to diffusion or importation of technology like cell phones and computers, um, they can leapfrog. They can say, we don't have a landline system in our country, so what we're going to do is forget it. We're never going to install it. We're going right to cell phones. And this leapfrogging happened in many regions of the world when cell phones first became popular. This is, this is a real possibility. But with some technologies, this is problematic because we're, we're talking about moving a technology to a, a tropical country or to an arid region, and it, it will um, fail at a much higher rate. Um, the other thing that's an opportunity for some countries is, is if foreign investors, if they're allowed in, they get in, there's sort of a technology and method spillover into the countries. Okay? Um, this is happening in China a lot. You know, Apple goes and you know, as Foxconn, you know, manufacturer of the iPhone. And you can just think of what's being learned about Apple technology by the Chinese and manufacturing methods, etc. That spreads in a country. That knowledge is crucial. It's very important. Um, or you could say with India, with the IT. You know, you start hiring, you know, Indian companies to do IT and then it sort of spreads. Somebody leaves a company and goes to another company, starts their own business. So there's all that spillover that is really crucial for a country. Next, demogra demographic trap. So half the world's at replacement fertility rate, okay? So two kids for two parents. Um, 
Now, when the country GDP increases, in other words, the country gets richer, the fertility rate decreases. But the, the fertility rate in poor countries is greater than or equal to five children, okay? Uh, so what that implies is that population will double every generation. So you have a lot of population increase. So, and then of course, there's a, the, a large family size, um, Professor Sachs claims, results in less invest in each child's nutrition, health, and education. Well, and then impoverished children become impoverished adults who in turn have many children. Of course, it stresses farm size, natural resources, and promotes more poverty, all right? And then there's this basic issue we'll come back to before is in, in a number of these cultures, um, there's a need to have enough boys, okay, rather than girls, in order to survive to support the parents in old age, okay? That's a really, really big issue because let's say you start having kids. You have a girl, <clears throat> you have a boy. <sighs> you need another boy to make sure, because this one might die. So I'm gonna have another, another. oh, I got two more girls now. Whew, oh no. So we're gonna have to, we wait for another boy. Okay, look how your family size is growing. Now, think of the statistical implications, ladies. That means in a poor country, girls are living in larger families than boys. Think about it. Right? So that, that's a real issue too. That's, that's something that Banerjee and Dufflow um, bring up. So he's, Jeffrey Sachs says that people, that, the countries that broke these traps used fruit productivity, the so-called green revolution, what happened with you know, um, gen gen genetically modified crops, um, fertilizers, etc. Remember, Four billion people in the world today live on fertilizer. What that means that the pro increased productivity due to fertilizer, okay, is feeding four billion people. That's over half the world. That's profound. Agriculture. All right. So he 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 that next outlines his so-called big five development interventions. He's, these are what he thinks we ought to do to improve things. Um, first one ag in agriculture, give people fertilizers fallows, green manures, cover crops, small scale irrigation, better seeds, get yields up to get rid of chronic hunger. Better storage facilities um, to get better market prices. I know this is a, a student from last year, Aditya Jayakumar from India was explaining problems in India where they'll get, they'll do these harvests and they'll get this grain and they'll, they'll store it and, and like half of it or something spoils and never makes it. I think in the U.S., does anybody know the stat on this? I believe in the U.S., half of all food's wasted. Bet somehow between growing it to, to table and then off table, thrown off the table. Okay. Um, next, in health, he says we need uh, staffed village clinics for every 5,000 people that would provide bed nets, get, to avoid mosquito problems and malaria, medicines, HIV AIDS medicines, um, for example, the low-cost Bactrim um, and uh, reproductive health services also. And education. Well, meals for children at school. A lot of that happens in the United States, right? It needs to happen more other places. Vocational training, computer literacy. It's amazing to hear him say that. Uh, infrastructure ma maintenance and electric wiring, uh, gener generator use, water harvesting, bore wells that's for water carpentry etc so that that stuff right there is quite interesting he calls out for education on these topics here um and uh in communities he want he wants somebody that can run around and fix things in the community you know the the wiring if you have electricity um generators like a diesel generator perhaps if you, if you don't have electricity um to, to use various uh, good water uh, harvesting techniques, to maintain a pump, to do carpentry, etc., And then some health training um, and hygiene. Hygiene is, is really very important. You know, you're not born knowing that you ought to wash your hands, right? You're not born knowing anything about hygiene. Your, your parents typically teach you that or you learn some things in school. And, and you shouldn't assume that everybody just gets that in, in, in some of these countries. So. Um, 
And the hygiene affects your health a lot. I mean, you know, if your hands are dirty and you're eating and so on and so forth. So these really basic things are important. Um, training in things about HIV and AIDS is to understand, you know, how you're putting yourself at risk, how to avoid malaria. Training in computer and mobile phone use. Cool. Oh, man, that's, that's STEM education. And then he says power transfer and communication. So this is a fantastic slide for the engineer. Electricity, okay, power line or offline methods like diesel generators, bicycles. Uh, for you, you hook a little generator, a bicycle, you pedal, and you charge your cell phones. Um, solar, power lights, the work or study after dark, okay. Um, perhaps a, a computer for a village school. Um, water pumps, um, power for milling grain, refrigeration, construction, charging of batteries. This one's nice, is a village truck, a shared truck to take um, product to the market, um, you know, to take sick people to a clinic or whatever it might be. Um, having a cell phone nearby, if you can get a signal, is useful for emergencies. I, I think of uh, Krista showed us a pictures from Kibera in Nairobi, the largest slum in, the, in Nairobi. And, uh, like she pointed out, she said, look, there's a cell phone tower right there, right next to the slum. So if they got the money, they could get, you know. And there was the cell phone charging station there. In yeah, 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 <laughs> the cell phone charging station. It's, it's just amazing. Um, do you get market information so they can get the best price on their, on their product? Okay, that's a, these are important things. Um, and just to communicate. People love to communicate. How do we know that people love to communicate? Because there's over six billion cell phone subscriptions in the world. People want to communicate with each other. I mean, it's not just you valuing the phone in your pocket. It, they val everybody values this. Water and sanitation is really fundamental. Um, so sufficient supply of clean water affects health. Significantly reduces toil for women and children to find and carry water. I mean, this issue is really important. Women, women, the issue of women and children carrying water, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of suffering, backbreaking work, hours and hours on end doing this, kids not being able to go to school because they have to carry water. Um, it's very hard on, on, on the women, of course. Um, so this is, it's really of fundamental importance to have, you know, be able to open the tap of water right here. Um, Okay, so springs, bore wells, and rainwater harvesting can be useful. Um, I just cut a pipe from it to a nearby large scale storage tank, so you'd like to be able to store, keep water. Um, Sanitation is important. Uh, in the movie we watched uh, on Friday at Cabrera, um, it, what, you'll watch it as a homework problem, but you you uh, see the connections between sanitation problems and um, health problem, water problems, health problems, education problems. So, you know, you may not feel like, and we have civil engineers in here. Some people spend their life doing sanitation type things as a civil engineer. Um, and uh, it's really fundamentally important. If you, wanna look, if you wanna go back and look at historically what's improved the health of the world, do you think it was a medical doctor? It was stuff like that. It was water, sanitation, improvements, um, and things of that sort that really have you know, propelled us to be a healthier um, world. Um, so Sachs says, an economist, of course, he does a cost analysis of all that that I just stated, and he wants to know what it costs per person to do all of that, okay? Some of that stuff's shared, you know, community like a village truck, et cetera. So he comes up with $70 a person, all right? And uh, to, to break traps, um, that turns out to be a sizable donation from rich countries and donors. Um, so they don't just pour money down the drain in the sense of just, just ending suffering. I mean, there's nothing wrong, for instance, in humanitarian engineering to, with just succeeding in ending somebody's suffering or reducing it for a period of time, of course. But you want to get at the root cause so you end it permanently. Um, his claim is this will end it permanently. Kai, because you're going to invest in infrastructural issues so they'll get on the first rung ladder and take off and then you walk away and, you know, they're happy. Um, next, technological capacity. 
Um, I've emphasized the importance of that um, several times already. Um, so technology requires training. You're not born knowing how to use a phone. Maybe the iPhone. But beyond primary uh, education, universities are very important for countries to train groups of technical experts, such as teachers, medical experts, agriculture experts, and engineers. Um, and you know, I think we take that all for granted. Um, you go to some developing countries and you watch what's happening. Their universities in some of these countries are developing at incredible rates because they know they have to do that. They need an educated group of professionals to help the country succeed. They don't need to be sending them to the United States or Europe all the time because then they don't go back. Period. Almost always. Okay, I could give you my own statistics on my own PhD students and master's students over the years. And, you know, a few go back, okay, but not a lot. Um, for rapid economic growth, um, uh, technological capacity has to be sort of suffuse the societies. It's, like, it's almost like part of the culture. Um, it has to, and in, in that, that's really uh, quite important. And the question he asks is, how can we do that when we don't even have basic literacy, <laughs> you know? And it, when, when he says literacy, he's thinking of reading a book, okay, and writing you're signing your name, filling out a form. For me, when I hear literacy, I think of it more broadly. I think of mathematical or numeracy, literacy. We're going to talk more about that when we get to education. Okay. Uh, he says that we should start training village experts on main, the main community tasks. Train somebody on basics of health care, agriculture issues. And he says, he, 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 he even used this term, I was amazed. Train a community-based engineer in the operation and maintenance of a diesel generator, electrical wiring, hand pumps, road grading, village truck. So what is it, I, mean, you, 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 I think a lot of people in humanitarian engineering think, oh, I'm going to create this device, a water filtration system, and I'm going to install it in this village working with the people. But you know, that's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. What you could do is go to the village, hang out with them, live, and teach these subjects so they can do it themselves. You don't have to hand them anything but knowledge. You know, knowledge is, ideas are free, right? Knowledge is, in a sense, free, except for it's a cost to you to go do that. Okay, but knowledge, in a sense, is free. It can be replicated and used all over the place. Knowledge is really important in that sense. Um, and then, of course, electronic methods for education are really important. Uh, in terms of countries, um, he wants to um, change uh, technology importers to technology producers. And that's what's happening in China and India. I mean, they're turning into powerhouses in, in, in this realm. And uh, they're, they're, they're exporting now. And uh, the brain drain problem I talked about a few minutes ago, the brain training problem is really quite significant. Um, you know, the best and the brightest of, of a, a number of countries leave their country because they don't see any opportunity if they're in, 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 in there and they go and get education somewhere else, uh, you know, typically the developed world, and, and then they don't go back because they can't get a job necessarily if they go back. Well, you can't blame people who are not going back if they can't make it go a living and use their expertise, their skills. So brain drain happens. Um, and it really hurts um, countries. It's not just, I'm not just talking about engineering. I'm thinking of all professions, okay? Um, you need to develop infrastructure for science. You know, you need labs, you need people, you need to generate interest. Um, Another thing he says that, that is really interesting, and I think I've heard this a number of times, don't, don't just show that some method works. He says there's plenty of methods that work, water filtration methods, whatever method. Because that's not the problem. The problem is, is the scale-up problem. That means how do you get that method in a whole region, you know, not just one village? How do you really spread it around? Um, Next, science for development. Um, so he says historically technology is important for development. And um, the technological break for, through via rich country markets um, or sponsor for poor countries via donor-led uh, approaches. 
But rarely, um, private sector develops technology to meet the challenges in poor countries. Market incentives are simply not sufficient for private sector research and development. That's an amazing statement, and I think he's right. In other words, when is it is a company in the United States developing a product for a developing country? This isn't going on that much. We're going to talk about this, however, when we come to social business. Okay? Um, so it says the scientific community ignores um, poor countries. Um, we need, he says we need to identify priority needs from poor, mobilize the donor community to support research and development. You know, this might be research and development for malaria. How much does the U.S. care about malaria when there's not much incidence of malaria in the U.S., right? So it doesn't get as much attention. Okay. So he says that the scientific needs for the poor are the following. And I'm not going to read all the words. I'm just going to talk about a highlight. We've got to address diseases of the poor, um, typical tropical diseases, you know, like malaria. Um, we have to learn how to do better at tropical agriculture, okay, with other technologies in agriculture. We have to work on energy systems in remote and rural areas, so for off-grid power, like solar. We have to, do, he, he says we have to do climate forecasting and adjustment, um, and this is useful in agriculture. Um, we have to be better at water management. Um, water management is an important issue. Um, we need technologies for harvesting, desalination, small-scale integration, etc., And then sustainable management of um, ecosystems. Okay. So he says, any poverty will reduce population size. So because we're going to remove an economic dependence on children. Um, we don't need them, you know, we don't need Chino to run out to the farm every day and do farming so we can survive. Chino can go get an education. Okay. Um, high tr child mortality rates result in high populations because people have more babies so that they can make sure they have enough kids to support them economically. Um, and uh, <coughs> if we can move towards commercial farming, modern methods, we will need fewer kids on the farms doing farm work. If we have pipe waters, kids don't need to fetch it, um, nor does mom. Um, and if we have fewer children, the mother would be freed from child care more and could help economically, okay? So there's certainly a role for contraceptives there. Um, and then if we have smaller families, we have an increased investment per child. So, lessons for the engineer. All right, so you're going to find when you start reading in this area that um, most people don't even know what an engineer is, okay? Socks is one of them for the most part. Uh, he doesn't understand differences between science, engineering, and technology. It's amazing. I mean, he'll say science, and he means technology. He'll say science, and he means engineering. Okay? So, so when you're reading it, you're sort of like, why doesn't he know this? Well, just try it out. Most, you go to a party with no, you're the only engineer, and start up a conversation. Nobody knows what an engineer is does okay the, a lot of these people the educated people what I find is they're doing just like Sachs and I just, they, they think or Easterly will come to they think they took calculus maybe as an undergraduate and they were surrounded by engineers and they think well and then they, they dump that stuff they go do their stuff and they think that all we do is solve calculus problems but really it's, it's just shocking so what it, what it means is it really hurts the field because what it means is they think every problem we work on has one solution and all you have to do is find it and it's a sequence of steps to find that solution. That's what a calculus problem is, right? That is not engineering. That's so far from engineering it's unbelievable. Okay, so there's a huge lack of understanding of engineering um, or even the role of engineering. Um, he names, he says, a number of engineering problems, he says they're science problems. Well, they're clearly not science problems. Science is uncovering knowledge. Engineers using knowledge to change the world, to make practical solutions. Um, so be prepared for this. You're going to see it all over the place. Um, Sachs introduces something called clinical economics, uh, which is a pretty interesting read. He, he's basically criticizing his own field of development economics, saying they're not, we're not educating 
development economists the proper way to be able to uh, confront the problem of development. It's like, wow. And this is a very prominent economist, a professor at a top university. So I'll, I'll let you uh, read about that. But I found it also interesting when you're reading this that you really think engineers need to be at the table in the World Bank, in the UN. I mean, if, if technology is so important for development, do we want a bunch of social scientists making decisions? Yeah, but they ought to talk to somebody that creates technology, right? Engineers should be at the table. Um, <coughs> so it's, it's kind of interesting, too, when he complains about the methodology and the approach that's being used by development economists, his complaints are all, like, really confusing because you listen to it and it's like, well, of course they should be doing that. That's what we do in engineering all the time to solve a problem. So it, it's kind of mind-blowing actually, to, to hear him talk about this, okay? Um, so, but he recognizes a lot of stuff, too. I mean, he's getting, I mean, I don't want to be too critical here. I like, I mean, I like the book, and I like the age of sustainable development, too. I think he does an excellent job at it. I, I don't know anybody who could write a book like that. Um, so, he recognizes problems with off-the-shelf technologies, that they need to be adapted. He really uh, highlights the importance of the technological capacity at all levels. It's fantastic. He's right on target, I think. And this idea of good solutions need to be scaled up. So in many of the major issues, boy, he's spot on. I mean, uh, from everything else I've read and seen myself. So in, in overall, I'm just quibbling over not being understood as an engineer. Okay? Anyway.